Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fadwa Wazwaz. I wanted to do a short video, and this is going to help us because a lot of times speakers do not realize how at times, as I mentioned in my study, Islam, people will like give a hadith, you know, like the saying of Prophet Muhammad, upon him, peace and blessings, or a verse from the Quran, or they quote another prophet. But they're using the spirit or the intelligence either of Satan or the Pharaoh. Just wanted to give an example just to help us reflect on it. The title of this video is From Judgment to Reflection. Judgment, they say, is a confession of character. Again, judgment is a confession of character. So let's read this judgment together. You'll notice a lot of you. Your inner peace, inner freedom, and joy are not rooted in what you show to the world, what you express loudly, or the truth you claim to have. You can show the world many things and claim to speak your truths to others, but if in the depth of your heart, you, notice again the word you, don't know and believe those truths you are trying to outwardly express, you will not be at peace. In fact, you will exert so much energy trying to get others to believe them and validate them because you don't believe them yourself. So be honest with yourself and know that your peace, joy, and freedom is rooted in what you show to God and yourself, and what you speak to your own self. When no one sees you and your truths, you genuinely believe in at your core. This is called judgment. It's a confession of character. What does it mean, a confession of character? I mean, this writer or speaker is speaking behind a mask. She's trying to fix others, but as the Quran says, you know, and, and you study the scripture. So here she's studying the scripture. Should have said it in Arabic. You are enjoining people to righteousness and you forget yourselves and you are studying the scripture. So you always speak, if you're someone who studies the scripture, you should be taking that message, whatever you want to give out, say it to yourself first, and then say it to the other. So this is what really is missing in the conversation. This is what the speaker needs to say. My inner peace, inner freedom, and joy are not rooted in what I show to the world, what I express loudly, or the truths I claim to have, I can show the world many things and claim to speak my truth to others. But if in the depth of my heart, I don't know and believe those truths, I am trying to outwardly express, I will not be at peace. In fact, I will exert much energy trying to get others to believe them and validate them because I don't believe them myself. So being honest with myself and knowing that my peace, joy, and freedom are rooted in what I show to God and myself and what I speak to my own self when no one sees me and in truth, I genuinely believe in at my core. So this is what is missing that the speaker is not saying. So the nurturing that really needs to take place is this. You have to nurture the person from judgment to reflection. You see that in the Quran. I'm going to give you a case study in the Quran from judgment to reflection, from seeing one with one eye to seeing with both, with both eyes. And a lot of times we speak with one eye, judgment. We don't speak with both eyes, which is reflection, the reflection mode. Judgment is a confession of character, it reveals what we value how we perceive the world around us. Our judgments often reflect our own biases, beliefs, assumptions, and personal experiences. Usually it's like you're telling others 
to fix themselves because you see your reflection in them. And you don't like that reflection in them. So you are trying to fix them instead of looking inward and fixing you. Because when you are speaking in reflection mode and you have fixed you, when you look at others and you see like what doesn't comfort you, it doesn't bother you so much. Why? Because internally, the power and the strength and the faith that you have, you can look away. You know, they're transgressing your bound. Obviously, you could do, you know, like, uh, you know, based on certain laws and certain guidelines, you can push them away. But this is where people, again, speak in judgment mode. And they're really trying to call out others for what is true in themselves. We must be aware of our own judgments and consider how they can impact how we see others. By recognizing and challenging our biases, we can strive to make more fair and objective assessment of people and situations. This is why, for example, a pious man, a true man, like Joseph, if he sees someone like Zuleika, he can walk away. A pious woman, a true woman like Mary, Maryam, Mary, if someone comes into her, you know, quarters and they're not supposed to be there, she can put God before them. Notice how they respond with the tone of reflection, not the tone of judgment. And they exercise the power that they have over themselves. Being mindful of our judgments allows us to approach situations with empathy and understanding. You, can, you saw that in both situations. We can work towards a more equitable society through self-reflection. We can evolve and contribute positively to the world by constantly evaluating and adjusting our judgments. So next time you judge others, plagiarize others, ask yourself what biases, assumptions, and desires influence your thoughts and actions. What does this judgment reflect on you? Acknowledging our biases, desires can lead to more credible personal growth and deeper connections with ourselves. So let me give you an example from the Quran. You will see this judgment versus reflection conversation. Not this one, I'll do this later. Yes, this one. So if you look at it, here's the Pharaoh. I'll probably have it here more closely together here. So when Moses delivered his message, so God sent Moses to the Pharaoh to speak with him. So the Pharaoh says, did we not bring thee up among us when you were a child? And did thou, basically, like, did you not spend amongst us years of your later life? And yet you did this, you committed this heinous deed of yours and has thus shown that you are one of the ingrates. So this is judgment. And I gave here, you know, the lens that Pharaoh sees things versus the lens that God tells that very same event right here. You know, where he takes a slice, you know, and doesn't tell the rest of the picture. So it leaves out all the context and the history and everything. And he just gives you a slice. Form of deception. But notice how Moses' response is what I'd like you to get at. Here's how we sometimes can learn how Moses responds in reflection. So Moses replies, notice he uses the I. Doesn't say you, says I. I committed that act early. Then I fled for fear of you. And my Lord bestowed wisdom and authority on me and made me one of the messengers. So this is the reflection mode. 
Now, this is the favor that you taunt me because you're speaking to him in a taunting manner that you've enslaved the children of Israel. So he's telling him, first he speaks again in reflection mode. And then in that same reflection mode, he's identifying what he, the Pharaoh said. This is not judgment, by the way, because he's saying you, this is not a judgment you. This is more of, he's telling him, just kind of like rephrasing what he said to him. Someone tells you something and then you rephrase it. You said, you're saying this, you know, so you're telling him, I heard you say that you are reminding me that you've enslaved the children of Israel. So you could see judgment versus reflection. And a lot of times, you know, we want to share something. But notice here, he doesn't tell him about his heart. What he actually tells him is about God. So I committed this, then I fled, then my Lord bestowed on me wisdom and authority. So he puts before the Pharaoh, not his heart, not his, uh, his father is a genius, not his, uh, I have so many friends, look at how many people like me, uh, not his uh, supremacy, you know, you know, I come from this pious clan and you come from this impious clan and so therefore I'm right and therefore you're wrong. But he puts before him, you know, I did this, you know, it was an accident. It doesn't always mean like strain. Like I said, you know, it was a folly. I was trying to do the right thing. Um, but it ended up backfiring in my face. I didn't intend to basically kill the person intentionally. It was not intentional. He turns to God. We know in the story that who he goes to who to his heart? No, he goes to God. <clears throat> you know, Moses turns to God asking for forgiveness. God facilitates the road out of the kingdom of the Pharaoh. And he puts him under a prophet, giving him wisdom and authority and sending him now to speak to the Pharaoh. So you could see from judgment to facing reflection a lot of the speakers when you tell them you know you keep you keep speaking like the pharaoh because this is something that troubled me a lot i wrote this 2010, the date in question when I had this training was actually 2008. But I just pushed it here around this time. I could show it to you if you needed evidence of that. But in any case, for me, the troubling part was a lot of these speakers were quoting Prophet Muhammad but with the thought processes of the Pharaoh or the emotional intelligence of Satan. So they'll raise a sound argument, like you shouldn't do this or that, but it wasn't reconciling with itself. It was not following the internal spirit and dialogue that one sees between the Pharaoh and Moses. Here he's using judgment. He's looking with one eye. And as I mentioned in here, He's also leaving a good part of the history and context when he's looking with this one eye. Whereas, whereas Moses is nurtured with wisdom to speak in the reflective mode. And he's speaking with both eyes. And then he also does not turn him to this or that and 
you know, says my clan and my friends and my, you know, my heart or my mind, or I got this many, this, or, you know, he places God before him. My Lord bestowed wisdom and authority on me. And a lot of times, like you wonder if these speakers reflected at all on the Quran, like, and they turned and had a private conversation with God. And because they say, if you fear God, you know, he'll teach you, you know, just like he gave uh, Moses wisdom. Then he would also give you wisdom too. If you turn to God, whenever like you did something, then God then, you know, nurtures you, helps you, sends someone with wisdom to nurture you with wisdom. And then you learn how to process that information, but also how to tell the story about that information or that wisdom that's encompassed in that situation. You'd say I. In any case, I'd like to draw your attention to my image, my honor, my reputation. Maybe that'll help us out further. What's an image? Image is our perception either of ourselves. This is like Pharaoh had an image of himself, but he had no knowledge of himself or others. We can also have a perception of others, but no knowledge of others. If you don't know yourself, impossible for you to know others. So if Pharaoh didn't know himself. He couldn't know Moses as well. It's not just he doesn't know God. He can't even know Moses unless he does his bidding. According, you know, again, he has a one eye. He only sees things in a cut and paste manner that promotes that perception of himself, that image that he has of himself that lacks, again, depth and lacks uh, breadth. So all it is is an image of himself, lacks understanding of who he is and why he does what he does. So it's a snapshot. When you're engaging the reflection mode in the way Moses was, then you're aware of that personality. So he didn't disown what he did. But he was granted wisdom. Doesn't necessarily mean like you intentionally did something wrong. He's a prophet. In the case of us, a lot of times we do things maybe intentionally. And, you know, like you could get really angry and upset and you intentionally want to like give someone a taste of their own medicine. You know, stuff like that. But the questions we have to ask that tell us if we are speaking in reflection or judgment, sometimes people will use I, but they're using it in a mocking manner. They really mean you, but they say I. They're really like kind of, they say, using it in a, implying innuendo and shade and insinuation. So they're not really using I in the sense of speaking in reflection mode. They're really saying you, but they're saying I because they don't want to be held to judgment by accusing you of something. But everybody knows, like that's listening to the conversation, that they're really saying you. They're not really saying I. So the questions we have to ask is this. Is the speaker, do they know themselves or that person that they're trying to speak to, whether it's giving advice, do they know them beyond perception? How much effort have they made to know them as human beings? Because that usually says about how much effort you got to know yourself as a human being. How much of that time was spent psychoanalyzing the other? It's also an indication of how much time you spent psychoanalyzing yourself. I mean, you're not like sitting here looking for flaws within yourself, but you're turning to God and you're asking God for guidance. You're saying like the dua that says, you know, you're telling to God to purify yourself. And so you're you're being honest to God, asking for that purification. How often do you find yourself pointing out their flaws to fix them? 
it's again, if you turn that question around and you say, how often do you find yourself turning to God to help you purify yourself and to see your flaws and to work on them? It's in, you know, the same effort that you've made to yourself is the same effort that um, you will have be speaking in reflection mode when you're encouraging others to do so. If you have not made that effort in your relationship with God, then when you speak to others, you will come out like the Pharaoh. You will start speaking in a kind of obsessed, fixated way, not in a reflective, inviting way. As God says, invite to your Lord. It's kind of a reflection. You're not inviting them by putting, for example, a rope around their neck and pulling them. You're inviting them by encouraging them internally to turn to God, nurture themselves so that they can willingly come, you know, to God. You're not putting a rope around their neck and dragging them like, you know, like a horse or something. Did I find myself feeling good after fixing their flaws? It goes again. Did you find yourself feeling good after turning to God, fixing your flaws? You know, usually people who turn to God and God helps them fix their flaws, they're not really concerned. It's not like they're not going to give advice to others. They just become, they realize that you, you, you is not the way that you give advice. And you let people know about the boundaries, like this angers God, this displeases God. And so you're creating that relationship between the person and God and less about you and them and them pleasing you. So a lot of times people will say, don't seek validation. Don't seek this. Don't seek that. Okay, but at the same time, you're criticizing the person to act in a certain way, not to please God but to please you. This gets into testing uh, people and God testing people. I, a little bit late with getting that video up, but I'll get it and show you examples. How well do I receive advice from this person that I'm giving advice to? So a lot of times we want to give advice to others and but they're not open to receiving advice from us. And this, you know, I, I this is my life experience. Like uh, I've interacted with some people and I'll talk about here, for example, give you an example. First interaction I've had with Hava was not actually a good example, like, or a good uh, impression. I have to admit it was my fault. She said something that really, really kind of ticked me off. And, you know, have you ever seen that meme of a, it's that in Sesame Street, that frog where he's typing so fast because they're, they're very upset and he's losing sight of what he's, you know, he's just busy typing. And it's an indication of that someone is so upset that they're just like, you know, furiously typing something. And that was kind of like how I was. And so I wrote her, you know, an email, and you could say that my first interaction with her was I was just really upset, and I just told her how upset I was with what she did. And she responded in reflection mode. So she's responded by, you know, how, you know, how she saw the situation and treating me again as a human being. So I did, still did not agree with what she was saying. I felt very strongly about my way of seeing things versus how she was seeing things. But over time, you know, back and forth, um, she invited me to come and discuss things with her, but I didn't feel comfortable because I was not sure about her position. I was still kind of a little bit upset about the article, but I sort of calmed down, seeing how, you know, she responded. But over time, 
you were, I started me continually to read her writings. And even though some of the writings she wrote did not apply to me, this is the thing about reflection mode. If something will not be your situation, but the advice that's given is beneficial to you. And so it's kind of like when rain falls, you know, you don't care, you know, um, if it's meant, who it's meant for. You just you just want to take it and benefit it for yourself or benefit for your, your farm or others. So you, you take it. And so by her knowing herself, and then you felt invited to know her perception of things and her ideas, then it awakened, you know, my understanding, compassion, intuition about her way of seeing things. And I actually turned around at my views and started to then agree with what she was saying. So she gave an example again here of how she spoke with someone and she treated him as a human being. Over time, again, I followed her all her advice, even though the advice was not something I submitted. I still benefited from all her advice that she gave to people. At times I didn't understand it. It was not like, like you know, a finger snap and you got it. But over time, as you thought about it, you understood how she was, how she understood things. But again, an oppressor worries about their image because their knowledge of themselves is just a perception. It's a snapshot. That's all they have of themselves. They have no depth. They have no breath. They have no understanding. But also for others, they only know them as, a, as, a, as an image, even if they lived in their own home. Now we would say, well, what's the purpose of Moses being there? Because sometimes when you speak in reflection mode, you're not aiming at the oppressor. You know, you're aiming at the circle that the oppressor is like, you know, around them, that circle around them. And the oppressor sometimes, because they spread disinformation, they miscalculate in assuming that everybody who's in their kingdom agrees with that disinformation because they hide a lot of stuff. And we saw that, like I said, how he replayed the event to Moses and how God replayed that very same event, how they leave history, they leave context, they leave you know understanding, and as well as their transgressions and their oppression that they are engaged in. So other people, as they start to then know the other, like meaning the people in the house of the Pharaoh, the secret witness, his wife, others, what happens is now you're building what? You're nurturing. You're working with now not an image of another human being that the Pharaoh has speaking on their behalf, but now you're getting to know them, the breath, the breadth of their being, you know, the depth of their being, you know, you're getting to know them a lot more than the surface level. So now you're able to communicate with them as human beings and they're communicating with you. Now this causes the oppressor was only engaging himself and others through image or perception to start to then crumble. And when that crumbles, then they have to see the darkness within themselves. And that can be a very scary experience. But notice that the Moses did not guide him to his heart. He guided him to God because it's with God, by God and for God, that that process can start to, which is scary uh, for an oppressor. If they have any light or any conscience in them, they can start to either go from that state to a higher state. We saw that with the magicians. 
And if they have nothing, then <laughs> the word will be proved true against them, a confirmation of their state will be proved true against them that they are full of darkness within. So again, the possibility that they could be wrong or contributing to a problem becomes hidden and ferociously resisted. They put themselves in a position where they can only give advice but not receive. And a lot of these, again, these preachers in our community, um, they really are in that mode. If you speak, if you listen to them, they're just giving advice. But I look to see where they are receiving advice. This is something I look for. And this is why I like Ramadan al Um He wasn't just sitting there receiving advice. He was not speaking in the judgment mode. And that's what kind of made me like like listening to his teachings is he was speaking in reflection mode even when he when you saw him with other teachers he was always like talking about the advice his teacher gave him the advice his teacher gave him it wasn't him fixing others fixing this fixing that fixing that person and that person and that person and that person so he was not promoting himself as a spiritual guru but he was promoting the process of nurturing, of turning to God, of growth, you know, of treat, talking to people as human beings. And that was something that was very, very important to me. And one of the issues that our speakers, our preachers do not do is I don't see them like demonstrating where they receive advice where they grow, where they learn. I saw that from, what's his name? Sheikh Omar Farooq Abdullah. I saw him in that reflection mode where he said, you know, he learned from this and he benefited from this and he received advice and this person corrected him there. And I thought that was, that was impressive for me. But the majority, um, if you listen to yourself and just take this presentation and, and uh, process it, they speak in judgment mode. They don't speak in reflection mode. And so I, I bring them back to the, again, the verse in the Quran. And I'll say it in English. Do you enjoin people to righteousness? You know? And you forget yourselves while you study the scripture. You know, um, something for us to reflect on that if you have not sat with the teachings that you are teaching others, because we know that Moses sat a number of years under a prophet, Shai before he started to publicly speak to the Pharaoh. But how many years did you sit trying to first be the receiver of this message, receiving it yourself, before you are going out there and sharing it with others? And this is something that we have to really uh, have a genuine conversation with ourselves first. Um, not loud noises in the air or behind walls because conversation requires, you know, there has to be mutual respect, mutual understanding, mutual giving and receiving advice, as I mentioned from Surah al -Asif requires all parties to be open to their contributions, if any, even if they're not, either by intention or they, they were not, they should be in a position where they could say, I'm open to receiving advice and be inviting a person to a place where both are safe to be able to give and receive that advice 
Um, and safe meaning that if either party transgresses, that they're open to then an agreed upon, like, um, measure that needs to take place or accountability that needs to take place to push whoever transgressed within their boundaries. So we know by that, for example, that the U.S. is not an honest broker because if Israel transgresses the boundary, it will support and defend Israel and give them arms upon arms upon arms upon arms. But if Pal the Palestinians, they don't even transgress, but they're pushing them within their boundaries, and they will again condemn and condemn and condemn and condemn and condemn. So it's not really an honest peace broker. It's just, uh, it's not even an ally. It's a, a, someone who's an accomplice to a crime. You can be an ally of somebody, but an ally does not support you when you oppress others. An accomplice supports you when you oppress others. So I think it's important for us to understand when we say, you know, friend versus accomplice or ally versus an accomplice to a crime. I hope this was um, beneficial, but it's important for us to reflect on it and how we see ourselves and how we communicate from ourselves as well as to others. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.